Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's a great privilege to be in this wonderful building. Uh, and, um, and we're very lucky to be joined by four distinguished architects, each of whom know the city, they revere Wren, and each of them understand that the challenges he faced are peculiarly similar to the kind of challenges we all face today looking, as John said, into the future. Um, if I may introduce them, first of all, Amanda Levitt designed the new exhibition road entrance for the V&A, um, a building for nuclear fusion in Cullum near Oxford, and is working on a concert hall in Belgrade. Rab Bennett, who designed the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, and is now working on a project for Puddle Dock uh, down on the Thames. Shumaya Valley, who is the architect of the Serpentine Pavilion uh, in 2021, and has just this afternoon flown in from Jeddah, where she is the artistic director of the First Islamic Arts Biennale. And finally, Kate Murphy from Foster and Partners, whose monument is the Bloomberg Building right behind us. So we are very, very delighted to have such distinguished guests. And they are each going to kick us off by talking a little bit about what makes this place so special for them. And Amanda, over to you. Thank you. I have to say this is my favorite church, which is probably why I'm here this evening. Um, Wren once said that nothing can add beauty to light. And in a sense, this church perfectly illuminates that phrase because it's all about how you get the light in. And if you look up, you can see how in resolving the transition from the rectangular plan to the circle of the dome, he created these multiple perspectives that lets light in from many different angles. This is very much where Wren forged um, a link between science and architecture. And after all, he studied astronomy and science before he became an architect. And it, it's a very intellectual building, but it's underpinned by this profound sense of geometry. And honestly, you can't ask more of architecture than that. Wonderful. Rab. I mean, when I look at this building, I think it's the most wonderful, precise piece of geometry, and every detail is beautifully resolved. And it's often said it was, because it was one of the early churches, it was a template for St. Paul's Dome. Um, but if you look at St. Paul's, you can, I can only imagine how he wrestled with that, because it's, it's the imposition of a dome on a rather more traditional church plan, whereas this has the octagon at its center, which becomes a circle, which becomes a dome. And if Wren had built his Greek cross design, things might have been rather different. So maybe I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Kate. I first came across this church probably about 12 or 13 years ago when we started um, looking at the Bloomberg site. And I have to say, um, I felt that walking into the space, it was a little bit like finding an Easter egg. It just really hit you. And it reminds me of being a child and discovering something really exciting. There's no accident that there's a big public space in front of the church. We did that very deliberately. We wanted to reveal the church. It has many uses, which I think is really very heartwarming. Um, I have to agree with what everyone here said. It's difficult to go last. <laughs> but I, I think uh, I grew up in a religious community called Lodium in South Africa, where mosques, churches, temples were the center of community life. Also, with our background during apartheid, these were really places where people came together and found resistance and resilience with each other. They found solidarity uh, through their faith-based practice in these places. And they also started to host, you know, myriad community lives, so beyond just worship. And similarly, I think for me, it's really profound that we're having this discussion today about the future of architecture, preservation, and heritage in this space, the, the fact that it is able to hold and host such a diverse community today. We come together around rituals, and they are what convene us, and it's a very important reminder for architects. Thank you. We were just saying um, before we started what an incredibly prodigious worker uh, Wren must have been. Um, 50 churches and then St. Paul's Cathedral, 
and a host of other buildings, of course, which we know about. But it was only three days after the Great Fire that he came up with a new plan for London, which was promptly rejected by the city fathers. Uh, and um, so uh, he instead had to find a way of rebuilding um, all of these churches and other things within London, but using the medieval foundations. In other words, adjusting to what was already there. And in a way, that has been the history of London all the way through. And maybe, Kate, you would like to kick us off on that. Yeah, so um, when we started um, thinking about designing the Bloomberg Building, having this church here was an absolute gift. Um, but with so much history on the side, it's um, fantastic for an architect because it gives you so much to be inspired by. Um, I talked about the public space in front of the church here, but we also left two large public spaces in front of Cannon Street and towards St. Paul's Cathedral, and that, again, was also very intentional. We wanted to leave a lot of breathing space for the public to move around the site, but the biggest challenge that we had was the uh, Temple of Mithras. It was a cut in half in the 50s when the site was redeveloped. One of the things that we wanted to do was to put the temple back in its, in its uh, real location to try and recreate it and recreate that experience. So, Rab, what would um, Bren have thought about your Puddle Dock project? Well, yes, I mean, Puddle Dock, most of you will know, it's down by Blackfriars Bridge. We're hoping to make a planning application later in the year, so it's too soon to go public, but I'll tell you a bit about it. I mean, it, it was, of course, in the grand plan that Bren devised so soon after the fire. In the 1960s, they demolished all the warehouses along the riverfront and extended the riverbank and created what you see today, which is truly horrible. <laughs> it's a, a pedestrian nightmare. So what we're going to try and do is dismantle the street network and put back ordinary roads in the open air, reduce the amount of traffic, put back about nine buildings of different types, some of which are retained from the existing and some of which are new, uh, with little alleyways between. So the streets and network of spaces between them are rather analogous to the still medieval part of London. And above all, we're going to connect the three buildings on the riverside with a roof garden right across the whole thing. Um, three buildings open to the public should have a capacity of about a thousand people. So we're obviously going through the consultation process at the moment, and I hope to tell you more, I don't know, six or nine months' time. Thank you. And Sumaya, you built the pavilion in 2021 in the middle of a very venerable park. What, what are your thoughts about that? Yes, yeah, so I wanted to think about all the histories uh, that are perhaps overlooked in London. And I wanted to reflect London to London and honor these places of community throughout London through this incredible platform in the heart of Kensington Gardens. And I started to work with how these places convened and gathered people and how they had architectural gestures of generosity in the smallest ways. And I worked to translate these gestures in the design of the pavilion so that it would hold gatherings at various scales. It was really made up of this series of gathering spaces as an honor and an homage to many different histories of London. Wonderful. Thank you. And finally, um, Amanda, the, the v and the wonderful entrance. What was this challenge involved there? Well, there was a, a massive challenge in that the v &A is rightly um, a grade one listed building. And so the presumption is you don't mess with it. Um, and yet the brief was to attract more diverse audiences. And, and in a sense, we interpreted that as creating a new way in. And yet what presented itself to the street on Exhibition Road was this very solid stone screen designed by Aston Webb. And so we reconceptualized it as a colonnade with multiple ways in so that you could just drift in off the street. But of course, when we went to English Heritage and presented our design, they said no. And so we went away we didn't actually change our design. What we changed was the way we argued the point. We discovered an original drawing by Aston Webb for the competition, because it was a competition then, which showed the screen as a much lower balustrade, and behind it was a garden. And when we found that drawing, I, I knew we had them. We had the perfect argument that this was no longer about hiding anymore, it's about revealing.
and we got the mission. Brilliant. Well, I think everyone on the platform, and I guess quite a lot of people in the room, are very familiar with the issue of planning and planning restrictions, as indeed um, Ren was. We wondered whether uh, uh, you'd like to talk a little bit about planning and the issues of dealing with planning, um, which Ren obviously faced, but which all of us face into the future. Uh, Amanda, do you want to start? Well, I, th I think Ren... Ren's kind of rebuilding on the medieval street pattern rather than what he originally wanted to do, which was a, a more kind of a sort of houseman-like master plan. It's actually, that is the essence of London. It's made London able to adapt and evolve in a way that Paris hasn't. It's kind of perfect. There's no, you, know, you can't resist houseman, but you can resist a very chaotic medieval street pattern but i i believe very strongly that the you know the 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 views the protective views of st paul's are extremely important and need to be preserved and it's up to us as architects to cleverly work around those rather than to challenge them Rap. well um obviously Puddle Lock is right in the vicinity of St Paul's and comes across all kinds of restrictions. There are two, really. One is called the London View Management Framework, which deals with the long views coming in from Richmond or Blackheath or Primrose Hill or whatever. But the one that's really close to St Paul's is called the St Paul's Heights. And it was, it's like a net if, which is laid over the area close to St Paul's. It limits the heights of new development in that area. And it came about because, as I mentioned before, the the, the medieval street plan was more or less rebuilt, but the scale started to creep up in the early 20th century. And in the 1930s, there was a new London Building Act which allowed buildings of 100 feet, and suddenly, two buildings sprang up in front of St Paul's. They blocked the view significantly, to, and it scared a lot of people, so the series of grids was devised to limit heights to stop that happening again. So that's where the St Paul's heights came from. And the longer distance views are now being reviewed again because if, I, I don't know if you've done the view of Richmond from Richmond Hill, but you can see St. Paul's on a good day. You now see a tower in the distance behind it, which is on the Olympic Park, which is completely unexpected. And it's rather taken away from the silhouette of St. Paul's. So the studies now need to be completed as to what those long distance views should, should do beyond St. Paul's, not just in the, from the viewer to St. Paul's. Very complex situation. Suma. Um, very complex for me to answer because I've only been in London a limited time, but I can say that living in Johannesburg in a context that's probably inherited most of our planning laws mm. and regulations from here, um, that sometimes I think the, the, the point of, or the, the intent and the ambition of planning is really to maintain vision and to keep a vision intact beyond the life of those who initiated to maintain a certain level of continuity. And from that perspective, of course, I think it's incredibly important that we learn how to honor uh, those intentions and work with them and work around them. But I think we also need to question what we are maintaining and why and what we should be maintaining and why. Um, and if I think about many of the small spaces that the Serpentine Pavilion worked to honor, we had a few fragments of the pavilion located in community arts institutions in London. In many places, there are incredible community institutions that have not actually been preserved and are not being preserved and are... Uh, being erased by development. And of course, I'm not saying that development is necessarily a bad thing, but I think if we aren't able to work with the energy of a place and think about how we evolve that alongside our development, um, then we're missing out on something. Something that we found on one of the World Monuments Fund's projects in northern Iraq is that when community members were asked about what they wanted to preserve. Of course, they mentioned pieces of architecture, but they also talked about their pomegranate trees and about other things that were really important to the community. So I think we maybe have to think about planning expansively um, yeah. and also think about how sustainable we are 
expansively because there's a lot I find in sustainability discourse that is heavily restricted also by our limitations around planning. Thank you. Kate? Um, I guess one of the expressions that I always like to use when we think about planning is this idea um, of being a good neighbor. And that was something that we used to just talk about a lot on the Bloomberg Project. A lot of the decisions that we made about the exterior of the building um, and frankly, even the scale and the massing of the building. When um, Mike Bloomberg took the site over, it actually already had a planning consent for a much taller building with a much, much bigger, higher center. Um, but during the course of the project, the, the viewing corridors for St. to St. Paul's Cathedral changed. So we lost area, but I think we all felt it was the right thing to do. So I think that thing of being a really good neighbor is really the best way of approaching planning and, and really um, trying to connect with the community and the infrastructure around you. Thank you. Now, of course, it was very important that these wonderful churches should also be centers for community. Here in St. Stephen's, um, the Samaritans were founded. Um, there's a tremendous Brigham of choral music and even rush hour jazz. So this is very much a community. And I wondered um, what we all feel about the, the role of architecture in building bridges between people and communities. Um, well, it, it's, it's completely vital and central to, to what we do. Um, I guess the way that we do it, and I, I, I will use two examples, is to, and two museums, is to see buildings not just as a building, but to, as an urban proposition. So in the case of the v &A, it was about letting people drift off the street into a courtyard, a completely different way of entering a museum. At the Museum of Architecture and Technology in Lisbon, we realized that that building would not work unless we could build a bridge over the highway and the railway tracks that connected the old city to the waterfront, and then to land on the roof of the museum. And the roof of the museum is like now an elevated town square. So it's for everybody. And it is as visited, probably more visited than the museum itself. So it's about thinking beyond the curtilage of the site. How can you impact? How can you best serve the widest community by thinking very broadly and very big about what a, what a project means. Great. Kate? I think, I think that this idea of bringing people together is really what it's all about. I mean, this, in, during the time that we worked on the Bloomberg Project and all the time, I, every time I've come into this church, I think it's being used for something different. Um, and I think that's so important. That really is uh, what it's all about. These spaces are, are meant to just bring people together. And whether it's an exhibition or a concert or, or what we're doing this evening, it's just that's, the, that's really the purpose of these, these kind of buildings. So, Samaya. I think, um, uh, as a South African, again, I learned in architecture school and understood the power of buildings and how implicated they were in keeping people apart. In South Africa, we have an extreme example where this was very intentional, but I think this is the case in so many cities everywhere. But if we understand that architecture has that power, then of course we have to understand that it also has the power for the opposite, the power to be able to bring people together. And in terms of how architecture does affirm our positions in society, in South Africa it affirmed who belonged and who didn't. It enforced a hierarchy and stratifications in our society. And I think because architecture is so abstract, we often forget that. We forget that it is, we are, what we are seeing around us is a manifestation of who we are as a people. So being able to see ourselves reflected in architecture is incredibly important because it gives us the opportunity to then be in dialogue with our identities, to feel comfortable, to belong in society, and then to evolve that sense of belonging. So I really believe that there are intelligences embedded in communities, in ways of being, and in the lives of people around us. And as architects, we have a responsibility to be able to unlock that and to translate it into form. Great. Thank you, Rap. 
I mean, you talked about a sense of belonging, and I think that leads into my point. I think, I, I think one of the most underestimated skills of an architect is to try to do buildings as the backdrop to city life. Not every building has to be prominent or to shout. A lot of buildings need to recede into the background, in my view, and I think if people underestimate the importance of streets. I mean, we talked about City of London quite a lot tonight, including the lanes and alleyways, but the quality of city life and the street life and the pavements and the public art and the access to various places and the heritage that you discover with some sort of narrative through the streets, that's what I find really interesting, and I think architects contribute a lot to that. So all of those issues, if you go back to the puddled ox site that I mentioned before, all of those issues were left behind in the 60s and 70s. They weren't thought of at all. So that, to get the chance to put back some of that city life and street life and to pay heed to the heritage is a fantastic opportunity. Great. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've got to the end of our allotted time. So on behalf of all of us, I, we would just like to say a very big thank you to you for coming. Um, to the World Monument Fund for having organized this, to the vicar for allowing us to use this wonderful church and being so incredibly hospitable. And I would like to thank the panel for um, taking part and uh, I think for some really interesting comments and uh, observations. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you to our chair. Thank you. Thank you.